success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Here in the studio, Nashville, Tennessee, another episode of the business side of music. Sitting next to me, a dear friend, an occasional co-host. That is correct. And quite fetching looking today. Well, thank you. I guess I can say that and not be Oh, absolutely PC. you can. Okay. It's technically a bad hair day, but, yeah. you know, I'll take it. Jenna Utes <laughs> is sitting next to me here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Always, always good, a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And then sitting across the table. Now, I've said it correctly twice now before the show. Let's see if I can do it again, because now I really feel the pressure on me. From Ireland, County Loath. I did it. County Loath. Oh, my yeah. gosh. <laughs> Third time's a charm. Third time's a charm. <laughs> Claire Cunningham is joining us all the way from Ireland. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. So we've, we've tried to get you on the show a couple times, first of all. You're an extremely busy person. We understand that. And that's a good thing. It's a nice problem to have. Uh, one of the times was you got to perform at the Grand Ole Opry, which we're going to talk about. Yeah. And what that was, what that experience was like. And then, of course, the other time we tried to get you onto the show, you just stopped talking. Yeah, a rarity. <laughs> only only the enemy can stop me from talking. <laughs> yeah, you no, lost your I, voice. Yeah, kind of severe laryngitis. Yeah. So I ended up having and, to. And as you said, yeah. it wasn't just whispering. You literally no, it couldn't was, talk. No, it was zero. I was in, I had to go to the doctor actually because, you know, I, as much as I try and avoid modern medicine as best I can, I'm, I'm always like, my Lord will save me and heal me. And I had eight, I think it was seven or eight days to go to the opera show and that was when it happened and so I, it was before the opera mm. oh my gosh so i had to i had to cancel all um interviews that i had coming up that week and in the past when i've lost my voice to that extre extremity um the only thing that can kind of get it back without of course resting is uh, you can get a respiratory steroid shot and it's like, even then, I still wasn't getting it. I just I was crying in the doctor's surgery. Like, I've literally got the biggest show of my life going up and I have no voice. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, but it, you know, we got there. So we did it. Well, let's go. Let's, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, as someone who was in the audience, I would never have known. So let me tell you, she delivered. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Let's go back to the very beginning of your life, if you don't mind. Yeah. Musically, at least. We don't have to go back to the, the infancy <laughs> yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah. But let's go back to the beginning. When did you really start to understand or have a concept that this is what you wanted to do? Yeah, it was in my bones from very, very early on. Um, I believe the first time somebody asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, I think I was around three and I was like, I'm going to be a rock star. And that like, obviously, I think when you're that age, you're there's something in you like your Holy Spirit is like calling out you know what what it believes and i truly truly believe that i just had that in me i didn't want anything else there really was nothing that like fueled my passion in life than music being a doctor or a lawyer no. or an airline pilot that yeah, just wasn't no, even on the radar never yeah never never leaned towards anything other than the music now fitness and and and, and being into sport was was a combination of what i did too which has led me into like today i'm still the same i'm, I'm my my whole life revolves around me and my health, my fitness, and, and my music. Yeah. An athletic type person, is there any particular sports you like to play? Or? Ah, well, I actually had this conversation earlier today. Um, so they were asking, like, what did you, what sports did you do growing up? And um, we have our own football called Gaelic football, right, uh, in Ireland, and so which I played is totally that. different than the <laughs> other footballs. <laughs> right, okay, because you've got soccer, you've got American football, you have Gaelic. Gaelic football is a combination of kind of rugby and American football. If if it gives you any inclination as to what that might be like, it sounds very physical. It's very physical, yes. So I played that. 
I also played, um, there's a sport called camogie. Uh, it's hurling for men, camogie for women. Um, and it's kind of like hockey in a way, if, if I could, you know, also uh, compare it. Played that. Then I was like track and field. I was a cross country runner, played basketball. Um, well, I'm tired. I mean, yeah, I am too. Yeah, well, you know, we come from such a small place that, like, there really wasn't much else to, you know, uh, put your time or efforts into. And so, sport growing up is actually sure. a big thing. And we're, yeah, culturally, like, and then we did things like horse riding and different extracurricular things. But yeah, sport took up a mm-hmm. major component of that. The county that you grew up in, uh-huh. very small. Yeah. Where, where is that located? Yeah, County Loud is the smallest of all the 32 counties in Ireland, and it's located just north of Dublin and south of Belfast. Um, so it's still, it's the last county um, in Southern Ireland before you hit the, the border. So, yeah. Growing up as a, as a kid and wanting to play music, who were your musical influences? I had so many and a diverse amount of influences, but my two major ones uh, were Garth Brooks and Michael Jackson. Um, and I think everyone everyone gets the Garth Brooks one for sure, but Michael Jackson, they're like, what? <laughs> That's like kind of a strange... Well, they're opposite ends of the spectrum, yeah, musical spectrum. Absolutely. But, but they're both superstars. Both superstars and both, I think, I leaned towards because of their... Um, musicality their their message you know the lyrics of certain songs like especially Michael because he was all about equality and wanting to heal like heal the world is one of my favorite songs of all time and then the mm-hmm. river by Garth Brooks mm-hmm. is like come on like you know and, and uh, <laughs> even I know it was in a documentary but the fact that I called my very first hamster Garth after Garth Brooks is enough. <laughs> now, said. did you tell him that at the Opry? <laughs> I think he actually had found out because when the host was asking me a few questions in the interview and he said, well, God has a funny sense of humor. Um, they knew that Garth was there and one of the... But no, you did not. I didn't. Nobody knew. Shall we so fill Garth in? Garth Brooks, yes, please. Yeah. So we, <laughs> I'm there like so excited and like if you heard someone screaming, that would have been me. And she looked so beautiful. She had on a beautiful emerald green, you know, flowing, sparkly dress and just did a marvelous job. I also want to get a shout out to the um, band that played as well. Oh, yeah. Um, They were absolutely fabulous. Um, I'm going to get it wrong. Well, so I played with when do you mean with Steve Earle? The, okay. Yeah, because I of got all, was to, Steve. Yeah, and then when I played, it was just um, Jar uh, Willis, uh, Jeremiah Willis. He's uh, the son of Brenda Willis, who ran the entire Music City Fest, and he was on the Ill and Pipes, and beautiful, right? Beautiful, like, absolutely insane. beautiful. <laughs> um, well, this was a part of Irish Fest, and I'm so excited. Our city is looking at um, at the different cultures because we are an international city now, and Southerners. Sometimes it can be kind of funny about that because this is our home. And I think I thought it was a terrific idea and very welcoming. And um, uh, I'm a big fan of Celtic music myself. Mm. But we, you know, we did the regular Opry show. It was fabulous. And um, it was over at nine o'clock. And I go to the Opry often and usually the curtain goes down immediately. And we're kind of, you know, shuffling around, kind of looking because the the curtain is still up. And I thought, well, this is kind of odd. And uh, they they let a few minutes go by and they said, sometimes we kind of do things differently at the Opry. Um, We've thought about bringing out um, another act. And um, they said, it's been International Women's Day this past week, and we'd like to show you a member of the Grand Ole Opry making her debut that we think is a modern woman that really represents International Women's Day. It was, um, so it was a video of Tricia Yearwood doing her Opry debut singing, um, I just lost it, um, She's in love with the boy. Yeah, she's a boy. Right, yeah. She's in love with the boy. So we're, we're thinking, Trish is going to be here. And uh, they, they played the video. And, of course, everybody was, was hooping and hollering and that and that. 
And they said, well, we think that um, there might be somebody backstage with a guitar, a guitar or something if y'all aren't in a hurry. And I mean, Garth Brooks walked out and you would have, I thought <laughs> the was ceiling like, was yeah. going to come off the place. <laughs> it was wild. No idea. Were you aware he was there? Nope. I'll tell you when I knew. Um, and you're so right. Um, like it was, I've never heard a crowd like scream. <laughs> um, so nobody knew. Lauren Elena, the last artist of the night, was aware. She didn't even tell her parents. The only people who knew were the staff. So I was in my dressing room because we were just doing some interviews and catching up with everybody in the dressing rooms. I, at around 8.45 or 8.40, I said, I'm going to just go back side stage and just watch Lauren's set um, and I went out and <laughs> we're just standing there and watching her and then somebody says apparently there's don't leave because apparently there's going to be a surprise guest and I thought well okay and I'm just standing there and then I see this couple and I see the cowboy hat and I'm like nah and then somebody says it's Garrett Brooks and I was like I honestly, it's rare in life where I'm like, am I in a dream? Because I look over and I see him and I'm like, it's literally, that's Garth Brooks. And the only reason why I was even more astounded was the fact that three months prior, on the 15th of December, I got a text message from Brenda Willis, who was running the Music Irish City Fest, and she said, Here's a list of the Opry members. If you want to choose one, uh, we can put in a request for you to play with an Opry member if it's, you know, if we can try it. Right. And I said, well, like, I don't even have to look at the list, like Garth Brooks. And I have the text message. I took a screenshot of it and I, and I said, because he is my childhood idol. However, Steve Earle or Vince Gill would be cool too. And so here I am then getting to play with Steve, which so four days before my debut, I thought it wasn't going to happen because I didn't get any like, you know, there was no selection made. I didn't, you know, it was done. So I was like, oh, OK, well, now I'll get to just do two songs instead of one and one. And then I get a message saying Steve Earl has, you know, rejigged his schedule so he can be there and he's invited you to play Galway Girl. And so I was like, sweet. Um, so. And you had teased this, yeah. that there would be a possible duet with an Opry member. Right. And I was like looking every day. So yeah, it was, and but same, because like that was, that was the whole plan initially, because they were like, there's always going to be an Opry member, but we're going to try and get it so that it's, you know, it's something maybe on the Celtic. Right. Right. And Garrett Brooks, sure, I never thought in a million years, you know. So when he's standing there, I thought, oh, my Good Lord, like God is working in mysterious ways right now. But he had received, apparently so when the Opry, when I put it in, they also put in the documentary that I was in in Ireland for him. So they knew how special and how big it was. And I truly believe that's when the host said, God has a sense of humour. Now looking back at in that interview, he, he probably knew. And he, I think that's why he said that. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about the documentary? Yeah, so the Virgin TV, um, I think it's it was a different channel back home when I was growing up. Um, they were doing a documentary on the life of Garth Brooks because he was coming to play a five sold out show in uh, in Dublin. Um, and so I had met one of the interviewers a year prior when I was playing at Johnny Cash's log cabin and they're from Donegal in Ireland and so when they were doing the documentary one of them contacted me and this is actually last May and I unfortunately was going to be down at the BMI Songwriters Fest in Key West and so he said, well, I'm only here from like, I think it was like the 7th till the 12th. And I said, oh, they're exactly the dates I'm going to be out of town. Mm -hmm. But I was like, this is, this is a big thing to get an interview for this. And so 
I rearranged my travel plans so that I would go a day later. And so we did the interview. They videoed part of a performance and then we went in and we did the actual sit down interview but the only part of the interview that really made it was the fact that I called my hamster Garth (laughs) (laughs) and I had no idea when it was going live on TV so I was currently on stage months after that before it was hitting the screens it went out that that night and I was getting floods of messages but I could just see a recurring theme like hamster and Garth I was like oh my God, what's going on? So they, yeah, they didn't tell me it had gone live. Well, I'd say that was the right thing based on the current events <laughs> and how that worked out for you right, at the Opry. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I will, I'd like to say one thing about the, the, the Garth sold out concerts. Mm. I watched some of the footage of that and it was amazing. I could have closed my eyes and easily thought, Bob, that this would have been any stadium in the United States. Yeah. The worldwide appeal of some of our artists is nothing less than amazing to me. And uh, when you look at the history, especially of country music, that's, that's rather yeah. uh, new. Yeah, I yeah, would yeah. say. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I'm curious, do you all look at someone like Garth or Michael as an American music artist? Or is that just a country artist or a mentor? How do you think about yeah, me personally, American artists? I don't artists? actually think of it like that. Mm-hmm. And I've never actually been asked that. And I've never even thought about that. But I guess because you're so used to growing up with artists like that, you, you don't even think of where they're from until perhaps they're speaking in an interview or something. Sure. And then you're like, oh, yeah, they are from a different country. It's interesting you say that because I remember back in the day listening to the Hollies mm. or listening to a lot of the, take the Beatles out of, and yeah. the Stones out of the equation yeah. because that's that's a given. But then you start listening to some of these acts and musically, you don't really, you don't really hear an accent. You don't. Mm-hmm. You Correct. Don't. But then yeah. the interview pops up and they start talking and you're going, oh, you're from England or Ireland or, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it makes you pause for a moment to realize, honestly, how, how worldwide music is. Yes. And it's such a, it's the best communication skill we have. Um, and it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Because regardless of your culture, your, your, your race, your accent, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's all kind of goes away when music... Music becomes the unifier. It does. It does. It does. Now, I'd like yeah. to insert something here and yeah. see how much you know about Irish history. <laughs> oh, gosh. But I'll also bring into the picture here that musical instruments or the act of making music can also be divisive. Let me take a break, if you don't mind, so we can get a word in for our sponsor, and then we'll come back and talk about that. When you have a cord sent at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, wave sequencing, or the multi-engine synth, Cord gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. Another episode of the business side of music sitting next to me, Jana Utes, who I Almost rudely interrupted, but we had to get a break in for one of our sponsors. So we're going to pick it back up where we left off and sitting across the podcast table. And you know what? I'm just not going to pronounce the county anymore because I've gotten it right. (laughs) You've got it. I've gotten it correct every single time. Let's just, yeah, let's not screw that up anymore. (laughs) It's Claire Cunningham. Anyway, pick up where you left off. I'm sorry. That's Well, I'm a student of music history um, and I grew up in a household where very few musical influences were allowed. So I was seeking out and learning about international music on my own. And I would um, go and read a lot of times on the back of the album covers what my my musical influences were were listening to and how they had been actually um, influenced and, and 
the, the styles, and I was amazed at how many of them were not American, because I did not realize at that time. I was very, very green. But um, so I think it's interesting that if you look at the history of music, that musical instruments and or the use of the human voice or music can also be a call to arms or it can be divisive. So I was I was curious if you knew or wanted to comment on the fact that in the 1600s, the Celtic harp was actually outlawed. Oh, because it was it was the time period when the, the Irish people were thinking about revolting against the British crown. Mm. Henry, Henry, I think it was the eighth that come into power. And so um, one of the local politicians or leaders there in town in order to try to squash any idea that the Irish would not, they outlawed the Celtic harps because the harps a lot of times would be used as a call to arms. So when we talk about music being important, I mean, yeah, it's the prevalence. And they destroyed the every harp they could get their hands on. Yeah, it's, I'm so, you know what? I love learning about things. And now that's my something new that I have Very learned Very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And of course, the Bible talks about the importance of the harp, you know, with King David and things like that. And I find that fascinating. Mm. But um, yeah, I'm very, very passionate about the fact that every people's group on earth will make music. Yeah. If they have nothing but stones and sticks, oh, yeah. they're going to make music. Well, we've talked yeah. about that too, and especially when we... We have someone from Ireland here, mm -hmm. Celtic music, and how the slaves brought over the banjo, mm -hmm. Correct. which a lot of people yes. didn't know. They we didn't actually know talked about area. this on another podcast show that I'm on uh, called Between the Notes. And it's, it's interesting how uh, the slave trade brought a certain style of music yeah. to the nation, to the United States. And then the Irish, the Celts, and, and the Scots as they settled in the Appalachians and picked up the, the banjo and, and other instruments and how that all eventually just kind of immersed into, I guess what we would call American music. Yeah. That is, and, and th when you think about it, go back, it took centuries, hundreds of years mm -hmm. to get to that point to be able to create that music. You know, it has, and I think it's why people feel so connected to it without realizing why. And also because a nation or a culture that's always suppressed or oppressed always mm -hmm. have such a, there's such heart and soul in that music. And you're right, because it does originate from slave music, basically, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's beautiful how it's all combined in a way to give us what we have today. And I do real I really believe that's why cultures such as Ireland or parts of Africa, parts of, you know, different parts of the world and, and the Appalachian, you know, a lot of people now I can see way more of a connection with Appalachian Correct. music and, 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 the, and the Celtic um, and just just the there's just a soul. You, you cannot recreate that. That comes from generations of. Well, you've got the power of the story. Mm. Yeah, you yeah. got the fact mm. that you had um, the family was all they had. You yeah, know, a lot exactly. of times they were share, these were sharecroppers and the family you know, they had to entertain themselves and they were very close and they all were handing down the stories from the generation to generation. You know, I think that I think it's fair to say that country music has been late to the party, um, giving other music its due. We in America, we are very guilty of borrowing mm -hmm. from other musical influences and really trying to claim it as our own, you know, and I, for one, am very happy to see us. Um, opening up and welcoming and giving the due to the international artists and the people that actually shaped our particular genre of music. I want to oh, yeah. back up even a little further because you mentioned two musical influences that really affected you growing mm -hmm. up, and that, of course, was Michael Jackson and Garth Brooks. But Ireland has such a rich, rich history. Yeah. Where do you start? You've got the Cranberries. Yeah, of course yeah, you got YouTube. Of course. You've got Van Morrison. You have Enya. You have Thin Lizzy. You have all of these great oh, acts. And I love all of them. But yet you chose. <laughs> I know. I chose two Americans. And you it's chose funny, two right? Americans that well, I've said earlier yeah. are on the opposite ends of the musical Polar spectrum. Polar opposites. And yeah. well, the thing is as well, like I said, there's a, such a wide variety. They, you know, Garth and Michael being my major ones. But funny enough, yeah, you say that. It's it's true. It was, But we were very Americanized too. We get like John Denver was another. Um, 
But, you know, one of my favourite Irish artists, he is known, but not as well known as some of the ones you've mentioned, is Christy Moore. Um, he covered, he's most known for his cover of Ride On uh, by Jimmy McCarthy, an old Irish um, poet and artist. Um, but his songs, oh gosh, I love them. The Wolf Tones as well. Like smaller Irish bands that didn't quite make it outside of Ireland uh, were major influences on me as well. Let's talk about you, because that's obviously why we have you in the studio today is your songwriting that you do, how does that process come about for you? What, what's kind of that mindset, that concept for you to put a pen to paper and create a song? Yeah, a good question. And it's changed over the years. Uh, I used to physically sit down and say, OK, I'm going to write a song now. Or I would have a title and I would want to write a song. However, 2020 changed everything uh, in the process of my writing and I can only say that I became a true vessel and conduit to the message from my good Lord Saviour. Um, wildly, I know this sounds crazy, but I never sit down to write songs anymore. But when a song is coming, I know it's coming and I feel this urge to either have to sit down or stop exactly what I'm doing and these songs that I've written since 2020, none have taken me more than 15 or 20 minutes, wow. some less. And I mean, they're full songs. And I, even when I brought them to the studio before in the past, they'd be like, well, maybe we need to change this. Maybe we need to do this. You know, let's. And they've just been like, these songs are really good. So what, what are your songs about? So my main topics are mental health awareness. So that encompasses any hurt, pain, but also the inspirational side. Um, personal songs like things that like This Is Me was one of them, like and just, you know, um, what's on the outside does not match the inside. Uh, I have a whole album that's going to come out now before the summer called Helping Hand, and it's all faith based inspirational songs. And then my culture. So I sing a lot about Ireland. I've written my mom a song that was on my last record on Dear Ireland called No Place Like Home. So this time round, my father gets one. <laughs> ah. Your old Irish dad. He hasn't heard it yet, though. Um, and yeah, so my culture, mental health and the Lord um, are my main kind of focus areas. Uh, I don't typically write for the sake of writing. Um, I just... You know, and then I have another one that's a pretty new one. It's called The Best You Can. And it's just like little golden nuggets like tomorrow's not promised. The past can't be changed. Live in the moment today. Be the best that you can. And just like anything that he wants to give me, I just go with it. Has your faith always been a central part of your art? No, not at all. Because I didn't have, I grew up Catholic uh, in a very organized feeling religion being the the thing you had to go to church it, you know you're in church but you don't really know Christ and with alongside the hypocrisy of everything that I right. kind of endured and just the feeling it was just not a nice feeling and um, I decided to just leave I, I I had enough I in fact I completely um, had nothing to do with faith I thought it was all bogus I called his name in vain and I went down a pathway that only I should have and could have gone down, but it was awful. Like I've endured a lot. And so in 2020 was my, I know I, people think it's because of the pandemic and it really wasn't, but it was the year at the end of that year. I, uh, I got. Well, that's major. Came back. Yeah, <laughs> it is totally major because it's transformed me as a person, but also my writing. And he taught me that, like, actually, no, Claire, you are OK at what you do. You're good. Like, I never liked what I wrote or released. I never was happy with anything, you know, and he is the only thing that's really brought me through 
everything in life. And I've just dropped a 54 page memoir, I believe, on my website. Um, I'm still kind of working on it, so I haven't really publicly announced it. Is this going to be a a book you're going to turn it into? I would love to do a published book. Um, I don't have the capacity in my (laughs) schedule right now to (laughs) to get an actual book published, but um, it's it's in PDF form. People can go on my website and if you want to read a hefty lot about my life and how I've overcome things, the one um, prevalent, you know, similar concept that flows throughout it all is that I've sought out every kind of road and nothing ever healed me the way he has. If you don't mind me asking Hmm. where there have been, is there one thing that sticks out in your mind that really gave you pause and you said it's time to change my life because there's a lot of that in music that moves me yeah yeah well the first time I had that was I think I was around 27 and I'd been suffering from chronic anxiety since probably very early on childhood you know and I just thought I was that was normal the way I was behaving and you know years and years and years of that it does become your norm and the way I was living and looking back now I just honestly I just you know and and there was a time where I didn't maybe want to see another day and so that's why I advocate a lot for like suicide prevention and it's where addictions came in and I'm not talking about the prevalent like the normal if you want to quote unquote normal addictions Lots of different addictions. There's lots of yeah, and I actually speak a lot about that. Mm-hmm. But 27 years of age was when I first decided I need. I actually do need help. I need to like start like bringing up what's been suppressed. Would you say that pain is a gift? I believe so. I believe fully in my heart that we have to all endure something in mm-hmm. life. If we don't. We're never going to know what it's like the other side. And like, I do believe we're never given any more than we can bear because that's why I'm always very prevalent in saying don't compare your story to another because maybe something you've been through is way worse than I and vice versa. And we all, but we can only feel what we feel and we can only experience what we experience. And... I honestly, because I believe the Lord knew I was going to have a platform and it would progress into bigger platforms that he he has allowed me to go through a serious amount of things. And it wasn't until I started writing that memoir, which was never the plan, <laughs> of course, he allowed it flow um, that I realized, whoa, like looking back now, how am I alive? <laughs> well, you're, you're, no doubt you're a vessel. Oh, I and you know what? I think we all are uh, to some degree, but whether you use it, you know, I, w- I would love to hope that I do use the gift he has given me that I can reach other people. And I would never say anything that I haven't gone through, you know. Sure. Um, and when I say that it's going to be OK or it's it's there is a light at the end of the tunnel or whatever cliche saying is there because it's true. Um, I will only advocate for it because I've been through it myself. Bob, you do this all the time. You know, how often do you hear, you know, stories of artists, producers that and and I mean, they, they've been to hell and back, mm. you know. Hearing it a lot more lately mm. in, in the last few years, part of what we hear now is 2020 when the COVID pandemic hit. Right. Those were lost years. Mm-hmm. And people are like, I, I can't tell you what I did with my life. I can't tell you what I did in my life. All I know is I felt lost during that time. And, and what we're hearing now is so many, so many people playing catch up mm-hmm. and really trying to rediscover themselves. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, yeah, maybe the pandemic has something to do with it. But I think the, the forced nature of all of us having to stop. Yeah. And take a couple breaths. In, in fact, in many cases, take quite a few breaths because yeah. we couldn't do anything. Right. And outside of social media, you know, we didn't have a lot of interaction. Mm-hmm. So it, it caused us to really start looking inside ourselves. Yes, inward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I've read a lot about yeah. um, the statistics of things that are going on post COVID. I'm very alarmed at what um, the statistics say about young women. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was set off partially by the fact that people were sitting at home and so focused on social media. But I'm aware that uh, I believe it's the ages of like 9 to 17, suicide numbers are up like 70 percent. Would you mind speaking to that and why you think it's more prevalent in young ladies or women? I, I Especially with the young ladies is right. because we're living a life through filters and the 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 new normal is to look a certain way and mm-hmm. to act a certain way and to have certain things. And unfortunately, that's all done through a screen and it's all smoke and mirrors, honestly, because, you know, yeah. there's a pressure, I think, on females. And, and I think there always has been a pressure on females to look and act a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, things, oh God, like look at the porn industry, look at the the magazines, the TV shows. It's it's this creation of what a woman should be and what she should look like is completely like it's like night and day as to what well, it I really actually is. I think the industry is. that we're in pushes a double agenda. Mm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I I even as a person you know that works, I'm not on stage in the industry, but I find it a struggle sometimes trying to figure out. You know, where am I to be a woman and where am I to try to look a certain way or act a certain way? Where does my faith come in? And what's the what's the median? And yeah, <clears throat> I, you're right. I think there's it's a balance. And and I think um, and I've you know, I listen a lot to podcasts and I listen a lot to to different people speaking on this, even like women in the workforce, like when they're said to be more emotional and that is like almost mm-hmm. like a negative. Right. Um, and it's it's funny because it's that's by nature. I think it's designed that way. And life wouldn't be very yeah. fun if we were all like this guy. <laughs> Wait a minute. Or I'm Wait teasing. A minute. He knows I'm teasing. We have a lot of fun. He and uh, Debbie and I have a lot of fun. I love that. But, you know, I've never really had a, you know, I obviously I'm a woman and I, I'm mm-hmm. very much on advocating, but I actually it's funny because I'm more leaning towards the male suicide um, aspect of things. And I think it's only because culturally growing up, Irish women are very boisterous and we're, we're, we're kind of fiery and we don't mind talking when we can. Um, but men uh, at home, unfortunately, have this. It's very taboo that you never talk about feelings and you never um, you never really show emotion. And so I saw that growing up and I experienced that. Um, And it's why we have such a huge suicide rate amongst young males, especially. And so that my audience I've always I don't know why but I've always felt more drawn to you know and I'll empower women Mm -hmm. in one aspect but I always feel for the males and maybe it's because I never spoke and I was never emotional growing up really too much you know and I was suppressed a little um you know we couldn't couldn't say what was going on We, we came from too small of a place to to allow that to happen and then I you know, growing up, it was the same. You just, I didn't want to show emotion. I was very more male orientated like that. I wasn't one to sit around a table and tell my feelings. Sure. Do you have brothers? Yeah, I've got two brothers okay. and, and one sister. Mm-hmm. So, and yeah, and I do. We come from a very traditional Irish women, stay at home and do the cooking and the cleaning and the men went out and worked that sounds kind of familiar yeah (laughs) and it does exist here of course we're going to take another break get another word in for another one of our sponsors and when we come back we're going to continue to have some more conversation with claire cunningham hi everyone i'm larry butler and i want to send you a free digital copy of my new book the singer songwriter rule book 101 ways to help you improve your chances of success that's right Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. 
In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer, songwriter, performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer, songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, sitting across the podcast table, Claire Cunningham. Uh, from Ireland, but you're now a Nashville resident yeah. and have been for a while. Yeah, I've been here when it rolls around to May 21st. I'll be here five years. Wow. Yes, I know. It's kind of crazy. Big cultural change, of course, coming yeah. from Ireland to the United States and then come to Nashville, which is really kind of the honky-tonk capital of the world. <laughs> it definitely is. definitely is. Musically, what do you have going on right now? New projects, tour plans, all that good stuff? Yep. Um, so uh, as aforementioned, I have an album. It'll be my first solo album. I've done albums and EPs in the past, but this is going to be a full album. Uh, it's called Helping Hand. And it's a lot of faith-based, inspirational material that I am mega excited about to get out to people because this is really a combination of it's and it's all been sung since 2020 actually uh even yeah 2021 into 22 and into just current even some of the songs that are on there are just actually only months old you know uh got that and then i'm gonna also record uh release a, a celtic record uh, nice. Another one. Yeah, it's time. And I have enough material for an EP. If I can get more, I'll do a full album, but um, there will be another Celtic. I love that. <laughs> record, Recording yeah. the Celtic project here in Nashville? Yeah. So my home from home uh, is over at RCA Studio C. So Eddie and Justy Productions, they're amazing. So Steve Cropper and um, the guys have the, the studio over there. And it's just, it's amazing they are amazing they understand me as an artist and understand the sound and just I, we've worked together now for years so it's just they're amazing yeah people. yeah they really are it's beautiful souls and just I just feel so blessed and that building as well has so much history it's got a it. lot of history <laughs> yeah touring dates and performance dates coming up? Yeah, so I've got a lot of festivals that are coming up. I actually am going to be doing my first headlining show at City Winery on April 30th. Here um, in Nashville? Yes, yes. So that's always been one on the bucket list that I wanted to do. So luckily the Opry has opened up a few doors that were <laughs> never Amazing. opened. I know. Was that a pleasant surprise for you from what the, the opportunities that afforded themselves from your performance at the Opry? Oh yeah, it's because I do all of my own, you know, I am my manager, book and agent, tour, whatever, you know, you name it, all the hats. So um, you, you literally wear all those hats at the same time. I wear every single hat that is seen. So a lot of people, even when the Opry were like, well, if you could get our team to contact, and I'm like, you know, you're talking to her. Like, and they were, they were like, what? You have nobody helping you? And I was like, it's not that I don't want to. I think people have this conception that I don't want help. I do. <laughs> Desperately. Uh, it's just, it, not, it, it just hasn't come about. And also, I have learned how to do a lot, you know. So I, you know, I've. I run my website. I answer all emails. I coincide and work logistics for podcasts. I am touring agent. I'm, you know, festival, whatever it is. I'm doing it, creating posters, answering people on socials. Um, so it's a lot, but I'm very blessed that I have the capability of doing it. But honestly, the Opry was almost a melting point for me because I was like, I, I, I don't know how much more I can do on my own <laughs> at this point. But again, blessed. Um, but yeah, lots of festivals coming up, uh, a lot of Celtic festivals, a lot of singer songwriter festivals all the way throughout the year. Uh, and like City Winery is coming up. And yeah. Do you see yourself getting back to Europe to perform? 
Hopefully, if uh, certain vaccine rules get lifted, then uh, I can. Yeah, we don't take I that into consideration sometimes. I know, unfortunately, um, if I leave America, um, I wouldn't get back in on my current visa without a vaccine. And so it's, yeah. And I it's just, that. yeah, okay. yeah. And it actually, I think they're lifting it soon. But in any case, uh, this is the year I have to reapply for everything again. I'm hopefully going for the green card. So I'm going to say it right now. To the heavens, please let a green card happen <laughs> because I want to stay here. Uh, you know, America is home, but for sure, I want to get back to Europe. Yeah, I haven't been back since like 2018 or 19, so it's it's been a while. And uh, you know, it'd be nice just to go back, see some fam, and you know, maybe, maybe. Well, actually, there was I did get offered a, an Irish tour. Um, you know, something I have not actually ever done, but because of the current situation, I, I've, it's not feasible. But yeah, I'm up for it for sure. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I am a big component of that. So. How can people find Claire Cunningham? Other than going to County Lowe. <laughs> yeah, you'll find her family there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say uh, the easiest place is my website um, and I've made it very user friendly for everyone so it's www. I got on it so it had to have been, <laughs> good, had good, to have been user friendly. I'm glad, I'm glad. Um, yeah, it's my full name so www.clarecunningham C-L-A-R-E-C-U-N-N-I-N-G-H-A-M music dot com and yeah, all the links for any of my socials and, and upcoming tours and different things like that are on there. Can they get music there too? Yes. Yeah. So uh, all my music is linked with, you know, if you listen to Spotify or iTunes, uh, Pandora, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, all the links are there and the YouTube channel and the memoir is up there now. I'm just, if, if anybody goes to download it, though, I am changing it on the regular until I actually announce it. <laughs> so because once again, you're wearing all the hats. Wearing all those hats. Yeah. Yes, it's it's a heavy head I'm wearing right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm blessed. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor any time that I can sit and talk and just spread any awareness to mental health, the culture, Jesus, whatever it is. I just hope that I'm doing my thing. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Jana? Yes, sir. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Thank you, Claire. We have really been looking forward to this. And we, we want you to stay in Nashville. Yes, you can visit okay. Europe, but you're a Nashville girl now, <laughs> yes. okay? Yes, I'll take it. <laughs>